Farragut 10. Uh, probably the ride of the race, though, was the number 54 wildcard of Brad Anderson on the PR Holmes Honda. He was 24th on the opening lap and then eventually got himself up into 17th position, as you'll see in a moment. My name is Paul Mayer, and I'm joined uh, for this first race by uh, Adam Wheeler from OnTrackOffRoad.com. Uh, Adam, you've just come in. The 15-second board goes up. What's it like out there temperature-wise? Is it pretty warm? Yeah, it's really stuffy. Uh, you know, the people out there are going pretty crazy for me. It's the best atmosphere we've had so far this year. It looked pretty good out there on the uh, on the banking because Ken Roxon lit the place up with his result in the first MX2 race just a moment ago. Can Max Nagel do exactly the same again? The five-second board goes. The gate dropped. Tony Cairoli didn't look like he got a good jump there. Instead, the Russian of Genny Bobashev, Kenda Dyker, right at the back going through the first turn. Nagel in second position, but Cairoli recovers well to uh, snatch that position back going in through turn three. So uh, all of a sudden then we've got uh, well a German up there inside the top three. He's going to go after a win here. We've got Philipparts at the inside in fourth position. Uh, Frostart just behind him in around about sixth or seventh place. Uh, but it's uh, Gennady Bobrashev picking up the 250 euros for that whole shot award from Love My Time as he heads up through the wave section for the first time here on this Talkessel circuit, which is very rutty, very choppy. And if you lose an ounce of concentration, then you're going to be off just looking in the opposite direction. We've got a lot of water gone down in that uh, straight into that right-hander, so might be a little bit tricky for the riders through there on the opening lap as the two Monster Energy Yamahas, uh, Stephen Frossard and David Philippot, not caring that they're on the same team and going at it bar to bar on this opening lap. And it's a great start there from uh, Clement de Sauer as well, Paul. I mean, he's up there in the top six. I mean, he's just fighting with Christophe or Sauer, who's uh, getting a little bit of a glimpse as to what like, the MX-1 first lap is about here. Absolutely. There's uh, Sean Simpson, 24, on the NS Honda. Another good start for him, just ahead of the number 11, Steve Ramon on the factory Suzuki, the Rockstar Energy Suzuki. But oh, goes on the inside, and there's carnage in the bottom corner there. Gonsalves, Gonsalves and Porcel there, I think. Yep, and Porcel losing out of position to uh, Ramon, but he goes back around the outside. There's Porcel, 377, on that uh, pro circuit. Uh, CLS, Monster Energy, Kawasaki. And it'll be interesting here because I don't know if it was me, Adam, but yesterday in the heat race, 25 minutes or, yeah, 25 minutes plus, no, 20 minutes plus two laps, isn't it, the qualifying race? Um, Christophe Porcel looked like he faded towards the end of the moto. Yeah. Was he tired or saving himself, do you think? I think he looked like he was very much riding within himself. I mean, he kind of does that anyway, Christophe, doesn't he? So, um, you know, I think it was very much a sort of suck it and see for him, really, yesterday. Well, in terms of the championship, Tony Cairoli has a 10-point advantage over Clement de Salle, and Cairoli is in second position. Interestingly, he's wearing a new helmet design this weekend in uh, honour and respect of his uh, team manager, Pit Byra. That's what came out of the press conference yesterday. Uh, he's wearing uh, like a replica helmet, Pit Byra design on that aero lid. And uh, he said he's going to donate it to him at the end of the race, whether he wins, lose or draws. So uh, a nice gesture there from Tony Cairoli this weekend. But up front, um, it's Evgeny Bobrashev, who's uh, looked like he's checked out here at the moment. Yeah, he's out of picture. I mean, I was talking to a journalist that's outside before this race started and said it would be a similar case if uh, Kyroni got, got first place and disappeared like Roxon, but... 202.8, uh, <laughs> the opening lap seconds. for Evgeny Bobrashev, and he's already pulled out a four-second advantage over Tony Kyroni, who went round in 205.9, but we know it's early days at the moment. Uh, yeah. As you said, it's hot and sticky out there, muggy, not a lot of air out on the circuit, and the riders are going to want to have to pace themselves, and maybe Evgeny Bobrashev, he feels that with such a good start, he's going to try and pull the pin and go and see where it gets him. Yeah, I mean, like you're saying, Paul, there's not my chair it's kind of like thunderstorm weather you know we're forecast rain for later in the afternoon but i think we're going to get away with it and it's, it's going to stay off until later but it's um it's not too easy that's for sure and it's starting to get a bit dusty and as you say all the ruts from yesterday coming through it's um it's probably the most sort of technical we've seen to out for a few years kenda Dyker was definitely off the back wasn't he going through first the first turn yeah i think he just held off and cut inside there but uh you know now the first turns changed that little section is a little bit tight a little bit narrower um slower as well um you know, a little I couldn't have thought that's too much advantage like you know cutting back and holding on the inside yeah but uh, we saw him definitely sort of off the back of the grid and then uh, yeah. here he is well, let's give you a quick rundown uh, bob Rashev has a four second advantage over tony Cairoli. max nagel is third on the number two then we've got frossard philippots fourth and fifth the sal is sixth the 999 of Rue Gonsalves is 7th and uh, Kendra Dyker is uh, in 10th position just going around Steve Ramon is he? No, Ramon comes back down the inside of him but look at that Kendra Dyker who was twice a winner here last year in this MX1 category on his birthday weekend he goes uh, ooh, was he passing? It's very tight, <laughs> very tight, and the, the tram line, the ruts over there on that far side of the circuit, very, well, pretty much what we've had all weekend. Yeah, there's, there's different lines, isn't there, but I'm not too sure whether they really carry an advantage. I mean, they're putting the riders side by side rather than giving them any kind of momentum or kind of oomph to pass another rider. So, Didaika then, 
alongside his teammate now, Sean Simpson, having disposed of uh, number 11 of uh, Barrigan. Uh, yeah, Barrigan goes through as well. I mean, it's like it, Paul, you were talking about the Love My Time, you know, whole shot award. I mean, Bobby has got a bit of cash in his pocket. But he's also got like a three-second, I mean, it was a three-second faster first lap there. I mean, that's kind of priceless, really. Well, yeah, he's had a nightmare weekend on the Monster Energy Yamaha. Didn't look comfortable yesterday. Looked a little bit rigid today. So uh, I don't know what's going to happen with him in terms of uh, whether he's got a one-year or two-year contract, but he needs to start getting some results fast if uh, he's going to impress Giacomo Garibaldi, that's for sure. But 4.5 seconds now, that gap. Bob Rochef to Kai Rowley. Nagel third, Frossard fourth, Philip parts fifth, DeSalle, Gonsalves, De Dijkert, Simpson and Ramon, uh, who's uh, found his way back past Jonathan Barrigan. So uh, Barrigan now in 11th, ahead of Christophe Porcel. So uh, he's lost some positions on the opening lap. So uh, I don't know what's happened there, but uh, Xavier Borg just behind him in 13th, ahead of Mark Deruva in 14th, then Guarnieri, Brad Anderson, 16th, Tano Leoc, 17th, Martin Barr, 18th, Schmidinger, 19th, and uh, Matthias Walkner down in 20th. Ken De Dijkert just going past. Uh, Rui Gonsalves, 4th, 7th position. So the privateer Honda very much uh, upping the ante in the second half of the season, Adam Wheeler. Yeah, Rui was struggling last week in Sweden. He said he just felt he lacked energy. That was a complaint of a few of the riders. I mean, it was kind of like we had arrived to the halfway point of the season. Um, but, you know, he said he felt a bit better this weekend. And, and Ken, you were talking about 2010. That was a real freak result, wasn't it? Because oh. he just, like, aced both motos. And then it was like, OK, he's arrived on that Yamaha. Barrigan ran the outside. He'll have the commanding yeah. line down here at the bottom of the hill. But, but then uh, I think I think it was the race afterwards where the Dyke crashed in Sweden and like split his elbow open. So that was like game over then for us in 2010. Yeah. Well, Barrigan putting the half move on uh, Steve Ramon at the bottom of the hill, who thought he could uh, swing around the outside of the Spaniard, but uh, Barrigan uh, thought better of it. That's one less, light, one less rider he's got to pass uh, in the next 29 minutes, plus two laps. There's... Someone else has gone down the inside. Of it. Was that still Boissier trying to kickstart the Yamaha? I think. Yeah, yeah. But uh, we've got uh, just under 29 minutes to go. Bobrashev's lead at the head of the field, four and a half seconds over Tony Cairoli, our series leader. Tony Cairoli looks to have got his head down. Has he clawed back some of that advantage to Evgeny Bobrashev? Is it down in the three-second mark, or has it gone out again? 5.6 seconds, so uh, Bobrashev, the opening laps of this race, of which we've had three completed so far, is uh, throwing down the gauntlet to the two factory Red Bull Tekka KTM riders of Max Nagel and Tony Cairoli, third and second, respectively. There's our race leader, the number 777, on the factory Honda World motocross machine of Evgeny Bobrashev. And, uh, wow, he's just... Uh, second half of the season yeah. is really starting to pick up for him. I think he's just believing in himself a little I, bit more. I think there's two things going on here, Paul. Like in Sweden last week, he took his best ever result, which was second overall, and Lorenzo rested a team manager just said he feels he's made a step up now. He's gone from being a rider that was on the fringes of the podium to actually, you know, making a viable threat for the podium. And the second thing is as well, he's just like maturing very much as a rider. It's, it's, I mean, he's a fantastic guy anyway, Jenny, but, uh, you know, if he can, like, keep his belief for the rest of this race, there's a hell of a long way to go. But, like, um, you know, he could really win this one. It's, um, it's just whether Tony's going to do another one of his late charges and whether, uh, you know, Jenny's not going to freak out by it a little bit like he did in the qualification heat in Portugal where he ended up binning it in the most ridiculous crash you've probably ever seen. Well, we know Tony Cairoli, no stranger to winning motos, 82 uh, in his career at the moment in MX1 and MX2. And uh, the situation with Tony Cairoli is, as we look at... Uh, Voissier just coming back in. Not really sure what, how that was going to play out for the rest of the season. But Tony Cairoli, um, will he go after, does he have to go after Bobrashev? Because uh, Commander Sal, we know riding with um, you know, shoulder problems at the moment, he's down in sixth position. That's a, a good ho uh, a haul of points in Cairoli's favour at the moment. He could stay there and, and still uh, extend his lead. So uh, it depends whether he wants to go after a win in his first race or maybe even save something for the second moto and go after an overall victory. Yeah, you just wonder if Tony's going to be keeping an eye on those lap times, really, and see if he can just, like, visually get a little bit of a gain on the Russian. Um, and that's what I was saying a moment ago, if, if, if Jenny can keep Jonathan Barrigan. Yeah. Wow, aggressive move. He's, uh, I was about to say, during your, uh, while you were just speaking then, Adam Wheeler, that Barrigan looks like he's in the mood today, doesn't he? He's uh, found a way past Ramon in an aggressive manner. He's just carved up Sean Simpson on the LS Honda at the bottom of the hill. And uh, he's going after Kendrick uh, Rubicon Salves now, sorry. So uh, Jonathan Barrigan 
who is, uh, well, he's got a disappointing season, really, yeah. hasn't he? Down in 10th in the championship. <laughs> I was going to say he needs to. He needs to up it because, like, you know, on that kind of bike and that kind of support, you know, 10th position is not really enough for, like, a former GP winner and a guy who was pushing for the championship at one stage, I think, in 09 or 08. Yeah, so. and he uh, also third overall at the opening Grand Prix, but uh, did, somebody, did somebody tell me it was contract time around about now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, I spoke with him yesterday and he said that he's got, like, you know, a, an option of riding a, a factory bike but within a different... Kawasaki set up, so I think he's considering that option. I mean, I know Kawasaki very keen to keep him for the Spanish market, and like he has a, he's the highest profile Spanish uh, motocrosser there. Of course, Spain, like you know, uh, just winning everything in every other category, rally and trial, enduro, whatever it be. So, you know, motocross got some catching up to do. Yeah, Kenda Dijk uh, are on board camera all over the back of Clement de Sal on the Rockstar Energy Suzuki, who uh, just riding a little bit comfortable, was talking to his mechanic Mark Fapala this weekend, said it was he's been working really, really hard on trying to strengthen the shoulder. Area. Area, but maybe doing a little bit too much but De Salle's fear is that uh, the shoulder just pops out again and he doesn't want that so he's just trying to build up that strength not ridden of course but uh, just you know going through the exercises and um, I don't know really how that's also affecting uh, De Dijka in terms of uh, uh, sorry De Salle in terms of how he goes racing now because uh, you ride with a, a slight niggling injury you get used to it back in there side, side yeah um, but with a shoulder problem like that, you know, is it something a little bit more longer lasting uh, mentally, psychologically? I mean, I think it's a mental thing just as much. I mean, he's out there racing. I mean, that, that's a feat in itself. But to really, like, push through and get the results, I mean, this is going to be a nice little battle here. Mm -hmm. I'm already looking over his shoulder. But, um, you know, this is the roughest we've seen Tuchin for a number of years, Paul. I just wonder, because, like, if next week we go to Kagoons, which is very loamy, very soft. I mean, it's just like a permanent ripple across that track. So I do wonder if it would be slightly easier for Clement to get through, like, this weekend and also Sweden wasn't that tough technically. No. Um, next week could be a real hard, like, punishing weekend for him. It could be, but uh, yesterday was certainly more difficult to, than today. The rut's deeper, longer, heavier, a lot more stickier. And uh, he had um, one incident yesterday, I think, Commander Sal, where he over jumped um, around by towards uh, st uh, the step down over yeah. by turn nine. Uh, obviously, that threw him forward. Then he went off track as well a little bit uh, mm. on another excursion. He split his finger open again as well. I think mm. it looks uh, pretty great. Him, actually. So uh, he's definitely in the wars, and uh, like Mark Fallon says, you know, when it goes for you, it goes for you, but when it's going against you, it goes against you. But he was very lucky, Clement de Salle, over the finish line tabletop yesterday in the first free practice session. A rider had fell, and the bike was laying in the track just after the downside. Uh, the one yellow flag was actually being waved for the downside, but it was just a state, uh, static yellow flag, and the marshal on the takeoff wasn't paying attention, and like three, four <laughs> guys came over, and one of them, de Salle, almost landed plumb in the middle of the bike, had to swerve as he landed, and that would have been another moment that you just think, yeah, it's one of them years now. The second half of the season, it's turned in Cairoli's favour. And De uh, and De Sal, sorry, is, um, you know, sort of picking up the pieces, if it were, and uh, trying to stay out of trouble. But um, anyway, he's down there in six well, at the moment. He's had a good night's sleep, that's for sure, because he pulled out of the paddock last night to get some kip in the local town. I think he's uh, <laughs> subscribed to the Joel Smets philosophy of uh, getting away from the rowdy beer tent and campsite here in Germany. Yeah. I think it was a couple of years of Joel Smets said in a press conference he was going to bring a big jerry can full of diesel and set light to the thing. <laughs> but, but I mean, Stephen Frost out here, he's got, the, he's got our attention for the moment, hasn't he? If he can get around uh, Nagel, it's not going to not be the most popular move here. No, it's not, but uh, Max Nagel he, he'll desperately want a result here, won't he? Because he got um, he came back here after the French Grand Prix last year with that broken collarbone, didn't he? And and he ended up sort of wanting to ride, and he rode, he, yeah, top 10 positions, but he was in a lot of pain. But he's 100% as we know it at the moment. Uh, has had some back problems prior to here, Brazil, of course, but um, seems okay now, and I think he'll be hope happy with third place. I'm here with Massimo in the Monster Energy Yamaha. Stephen Prosser's having a strong race, but do you think he can podium? Now it's four. I see some position is more far than other riders, so I have possibility to finish top three. Sure, it's not easy to pass uh, other riders because only one line is good, so you have to take the risk to pass, but sure, I think you're going to try it. Thank you, Massimo. Going to try or going to cry? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, he doesn't have to worry about behind him. I mean, Philip Arts is like six seconds adrift, and then De Sal, you know, under pressure from the Dyke, is a little bit further behind there. We've got a little bit of that procession going on that we had in MX2. I mean, do you think that's really forced by the track, Paul, or is it a little bit kind of, you know, the, the pace the, these guys are going is very I, similar? Yeah, I think the track is actually better today than it was yesterday in terms of uh, where the lines are and. Um, 
you know, I guess from a physical nature, not as physical in that respect. You know, this was like 20 lines through here yesterday, you know, from inside to the outside. But uh, as you can see, maybe three or four lines are not artificially created as well, like they did in Spain. And um, then we've got, oh, Paul Sells out. I was just looking down the leaderboard thinking, where's he gone? Um, you know, we're not used to seeing that 377, but he's, uh, he's in the pits. And he started off pretty good, and then obviously he started working his way backwards anyway, didn't he, before that, down to about 11th or 12th position. And, uh, yeah, so Paul Sell then doesn't look like his first race back in Europe. He's going, uh, going to plan. That's just him all over, isn't it? You can never, ever predict him. What's he going to do? A bit like Kenda Dijker. Yeah. Number nine on the NS Honda, who uh, looked like he was getting his wheels into uh, the rear end of that Suzuki of Clément de Salle there, number 25, but de Salle seems to have been weathered that storm at the moment and uh, just got his head down and managed to pull out, what, one or two seconds, something like that. Uh, Loic Leons, the Aprilia, bit of an overheating problem over there, I think. I think it's, it's quite terminal, nine. that really, isn't it? Yeah, turn nine, I think, over the step-up into that corner. So, um I wonder whether he's had a crash as well, with that, you know what I mean? Yeah. Did but you ever test one of those Aprilia's, Paul? They're, they're pretty heavy, aren't they? They were heavy, but they uh, they handled pretty good. The actual motor wasn't that bad, and um, it was before Josh actually signed for them. So, you know, it wasn't a bad bike. Rode the production one. Um, but, you know, I don't know why it hasn't really sort of taken Quite off. Right. He's made a mistake. He's down to... He's back behind Frossard now, so he missed that somewhere. So while we were looking at the onset... Yeah, Nagel's moved up to second, Frossard third, now Kai Rowley. So this is a bit of a situation then that Tony Cairoli wasn't expecting himself uh, expecting to find himself in. With uh, Bobrashev now nine and a half seconds clear with uh, 20 minutes to go plus two laps. So we're about the midway point of this first MX1 race. And I uh, wonder how that's going to affect Max Nagel then in second position. He's got Frossard breathing down his neck as he has been pretty much for the whole race. And, uh, well, suddenly he thinks maybe he can go after a victory here. He's got to pull out all the stops if he's going to try and do anything yeah. about uh, Bobrashev. I think it must be three, three and a half years since a factory Honda won a moto. I mean, I think Leoc uh, grabbed one last year on the, the satellite bike, but um, yeah, it's going to be, uh, well, I think they're going to go crazy with the Italians. Yeah, well, it was the, he also won in uh, Catalonia, didn't he? Um, Tenno Leoc last year, he won the overall Grand Prix yep. for LS Honda. So, uh, you know, that was, that was good for him, but uh, didn't he also have a good ride at um, Czech Republic uh, last year? Uh, Tenno Leoc. He might have won the moto there, but he didn't win he the did. GP yet. No, no, no. But uh, anyway, we're back with our, uh, well, leaders. Bob Rechef, nine and a half seconds clear. Max Nagel now second. Frossard third. We're looking at Tony Cairoli. He's down in fourth after a mistake somewhere out on the circuit. We're going down to pit lane. We're here in KTM, and I'm with Stefan Pieter. At the moment, you're running uh, second place and fourth place uh, with Nagel and Antonio Cairoli. Is it great to be here to watch your riders? The Germany Grand Prix is basically our home race because we don't have a race in Austria so far. Uh, the two guys are in a good position, but it takes another 15 minutes. Let's see what's coming out. Thank you, Steph, very much. Doesn't come to many races, does he? But uh, he certainly picks them. I mean, he can't, must be thrilled with like you know the KTM 1-2 in MX2. But then he's been kind of watching that all year, really, anyway, hasn't he? Yeah, and uh, and also uh, a lot of KTM's on the grid in the uh, 125 European race as well. So in terms of uh, market share, market value, and everything else, you know, that's yeah. he's the CEO. That's what he's more interested in. And obviously, winning races will sell a few more motorcycles, and it helps, uh, as you say, uh, second and fourth with Nagel and Cairoli. I wonder how uh, Frossard and Cairoli this situation will pan out though because um, championship points championship points as you say Frossard only 12 off of Commander Sal 22 off of Tony Cairoli so he'll pull a couple more back if it were stay if it were to stay like this but uh, Tony Cairoli will be all more too aware than uh, you know than to know what's going on here in this situation he'll know that that's more points for Stephen Frossard and I think he'll want to try and find a way back past uh, not only Frossard, but also Max Nagel. I'm not saying that uh, Bobrashev is unreachable 10.2 seconds out front at the moment. I think that's pretty unreachable, Bobrashev. Well, we don't know, do we? I mean, he got tired yesterday riding aggressively, chasing Tony Cairoli in the heat race. He said he was on the limit and he had to back off to finish in second position. But, you know, he's going out and pulling out all the stops at the moment in this first race. But uh, that'll be a great result for him if he can go and uh, pick up 25 points in this first race. I mean, what do you think is going to... What do you uh, what do you think is going to happen here, Paul? Because like you've got three riders close together. We know the track's not so easy for passing, but then considering what we've seen in MX1 so far this year, it's just a case of like these guys could change positions every other lap. 
Yeah, they could, and it has been the most open series, hasn't it? You know, you look at, uh, in terms of race winners, we've had five different race winners. Um, and in terms of uh, the top six, only Bobrashev hasn't won a moto in the top six. Um, so, you know, you look at that, that's Cairoli, DeSalle, Frossard, Nagel, and Philippots, all the only uh, race winners. Um, that could change today. But um, four overall Grand Prix winners, uh, Tony Cairoli's won two, DeSalle's won three, Frossard's won two, Philippots has won one. Um, yeah, it's just been very, very open. Um, some of it, I think, everybody's pushing at a high level. Uh, the, cir the circuits have certainly played their part as well. Um, you know, everyone's holding that inside line there at the moment. Um, you yeah. know, Cairoli just took a slightly different route there. But generally, you know, I think the tracks are very, very physically demanding at the moment. You know, they really are brutal and they take it out of, uh, yeah, of the 12, riders. 12 and a half seconds now, Bobby Shepard ahead. I mean, that, that's uh, that's got to be a winnable distance. He just has to settle into that rhythm that he's already got and he, he'll take him home. His last lap was 2.03. He's just set the fastest lap of the race, 2.01.956. So uh, mm, maybe not such a <laughs> set into <the> rhythm. <laughs> so basically, uh, Max Nagel's fastest lap, 2.03.3. Uh, Frossard, 2.03.5. Cairoli, 2.03.7. Philippots 204. Uh, Dijk and the next fast is there, 203.8, down in seventh position, and still down uh, behind um, Tom Ordesal, who's found his way up to the rear end of the Monster Energy Yamaha of David Philippots, battling for fifth position. So um, Tom Ordesal, second half of this race, decided as well that he feels another couple points or another point is on the cards here in terms of uh, damage limitation. He said yeah. yesterday that he was really happy with the setup of Suzuki, but he found the track pretty difficult. He, yeah. he wasn't too uh, optimistic um, Saturday evening, but uh, you know, I mean, he's just he. If there is a rider who's smooth and just finds his way around the track all the time, then it's him. I mean, he's one of those riders that doesn't look especially quick, but he is. He's just going so fast. Yeah, and he's a strong kid as well, isn't he? And uh, sometimes I think his temperament gets the better of him yeah. in terms of uh, making rash decisions. He's still making those decisions um, that cost him a little bit here and there in uh, La Bagnetta. But, um, you know, when he's when he's on form, he's, um, you know, he's one of the fastest guys, if not the fastest guy we've had so yeah. far in MX1 this year. And, you know, he was a championship leader for a reason. And uh, he's, like we say, we talk about his mental strength and his uh, physical strength to be going after David Philippards for fifth position in the second half of this race. That just shows exactly the character that he's made of. But David Philippots, have you uh, spent much time with the Yamaha guys this weekend? Philippots and Frossard, everything okay there with them? Or Because I would have thought Philippots would have been battling for uh, first three in this first race with the conditions being as tough as they are. Yeah, I was checking out a few stats earlier on and he's not finished out of the top five since he's made his MX1 debut here in 07. And he won here in MX2 in 2006. We're going down to pit lane. I'm here in Suzuki with Eric Gavers. Now DeSalle, considering his shoulder injury, he didn't have a great start, but he's running sick. Your team must be pleased. Yeah, he surprised us a little bit. The start was not so good. He came from 15th to 6th place in the first lap. And uh, it's going good. It's going better now than it was yesterday. So we are happy. Regarding the circumstances, we are happy now. Thank you, Eric. I love the, the way Eric Gavors manages to roll back the years by wearing the cap on the way around there. It's like, you know, faulty going on 18. Nice, uh, the turn back style. <laughs> <laughs> if you turn around to the side, that'd be even more worrying, wouldn't it? Yeah. So, Clement de Salle, it was uh, Philippot, sorry, he won in 2007 in MX1, not 2006 yeah, in MX2. Yeah, well, he was only the second rider to win in MX1 and MX2 GP, Ben Townley, of course, being the first. Uh, and that was uh, Philippot's first year in 2007 in MX1, and he won the title the next year. Yeah. But Clement de Salle all over the back of him at the moment. Number 25 on that Rockstar Energy Suzuki, going after the Monster Energy Yamaha. The teammate to uh, David Philippot, so another couple positions further up in third place. He's got uh, Max Nagel one second ahead of him. Kai Rowley one second behind him in, his, in what's going to be a battle for the flag, I think. Here is second, third and fourth. Max Nagel number two. Stephen Frossard, 183, and then Tony Cairoli closer than he has been the last couple laps. A bit of a mistake there, slowing up Stephen Frossard into that left hander right in front of the, uh, the work area. And Tony Cairoli, I think, with uh, 12 minutes plus two to go, looking now to find a way past the Frenchman Stephen Frossard. That downhill section, very, very choppy yesterday. There was a big hole right in the bottom that riders were doing their best to avoid. There's Suon Zanoni uh, had a big crash through there in MXO. I don't know if you saw it, Adam Wheeler from on track off road, but. Um, I'm surprised, I'm surprised it's not catching out more people this track, to be honest, boys. Like, uh, you know, it's, it's been, you haven't really seen many people on the floor. I mean, unfortunately, Jerry Van Horbeek in MX2, but, uh, you know, it's, um, 
Dylan Ferrandez as well over jump the uh, sorry jump oh, short Carrelli, mistake yeah. there from Carroli yeah uh, Dylan Ferrandez who should have been a wild card here lasted two laps in pre-qualifying yesterday he broke uh, well, he's got a hairline fracture of the wrist um, so uh, he won't make next week's uh, European MX2 round in uh, Latvia I think with, with those guys yeah. again next week so uh, yeah sticking him in for a wild card entry and not working out for him uh, Dylan Ferrandez although a hairline fracture fracture could maybe be uh, you know, quick fix situation down the old laser yeah. oxygen tunic, but uh, we'll have to wait and see if he has access to one of those. I mean, it's fairly obvious from what we're seeing, but these three riders here are kind of circulating within half a second of each other. I mean, that means if they keep doing that, then there's going to be no kind of overtaking because they're just not going to be close enough and not in a position enough to force their way through. I'm just wondering whether Tony Cairoli knows, obviously, that, uh, you know, the lead is gone. 13 seconds. Evgeny Bobrashev holds that advantage at the moment. But... Um, I think he feels that he might have the measure of these two guys. As long as he's within striking distance of uh, Stephen Crossard and Max Nagel, I think, you know, now is the time that he's going to go and uh, do what he normally does, you know? Yes. Because he's knocking all over the back door there of the Yamaha. Yeah. And uh, trying to get cute with the lines as well, already, you know, using different lines. Going uh, inside, sweeping around, and, uh, you know, I think he's getting ready to find a way through. Well, nice line we're... there, look at that. Yeah. Not even in the deep rut. He's, uh, he's assessed the situation. And now he's getting ready to go, I think, Kai Rowley. Well, more than that, I think he's seeing Nagel get a little bit further away and is thinking, right, I've got to get past the next position right now. Uh, we'll get the sign now that there's 10 minutes left in the race. Nicely over there, going down the inside. Is he going to pull the Barrigan move? Oh, and Frossard almost off the bike, coming up and over the hill. Has that allowed Cairo to the time to go down the inside? He gets squeezed at the end of pit lane as they rejoin the start straight, and uh, 10 minutes plus two to go. Suddenly, this battle for third position between the black Monster Energy Yamaha of Stephen Frossard, the 183, and the 222. Red Bull Tech of Factory KTM of Tony Cairoli. They've allowed Max Nagel just to sneak a bit of an advantage over them because he's going away in the opposite direction over a tabletop jump. We've got a back marker just in between these guys here. Can't quite make out the number on that, but uh, it's irrelevant. But uh, Evgeny Bobrashev, well, that was 13 seconds a moment ago. That's down to 12.8, so 10 minutes to go. You would expect Bobrashev to be in uh, control of that situation, but maybe he's thinking about the bonus and the paycheck and the, <laughs> yeah. and the first win and everything else, and maybe it's going to start to get away from him. If that's the case, then we're going to have a four-way battle for what could be the first step of the podium. I'm sure Honda employees around the uh, the world watching this appreciated that comment, Paul, that, that sight of positive. <laughs> positive uh, <laughs> no, but we saw, him, we, we saw him in Latvia last year, didn't we? He was on the verge yeah. of taking a no, win, and then suddenly two or yeah. three laps to go, Cairoli, uh, sorry, uh, DeSalle found a way through. Um, and he had that a couple of times. I know you made the comment this year as uh, DeSalle still trying to find a way past uh, oh, David Philippe Made it. I think oh. he's done it. So both the Monster Energy Yamahas coming under attack. One from the Suzuki of Clement de Salle. The second one, or the leading one, shall we say, Stephen Frossard coming under attack from Tony Cairoli. Well, Philippas and Clement de Salle really in a tight fight. They did their fastest laps. Cairoli the jumping one. straight. Oh, the back end just swaps around on him. Got the tight inside line here. You watch this. Gets on the power nice and early. He's got commanding blind down into this left-hander. Cairoli is about to go through. Both riders scrub the way in, but Frossard's not going to back out of a challenge. But he has nowhere else to go as Tony Cairoli slides his way into third position and goes after his teammate, Max Nagel. So with eight plus two to go then, Bobrashev has a 12.8 second advantage. Nagel second, Cairoli now third. Dropping down the hill. <coughs> David Philipparts has been overtaken by Clement de Salle in that manoeuvre just around half a lap ago. Looked like de Salle got hung up over the front of the bike then, just catching a braking bump. Uh, Kenda Dyko going after David Philipparts as well, so uh, we oh, could Parts see. Is sketchy down the hill. It's, uh, that's the line that Cairoli had, isn't it? I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's just been a little bit inventive there, and if you're not going uh, to be behind him and see that, then you're not really going to learn that one. No one else is really picking it up. Well, it just looked like it was just brand new ground, didn't it? You know, that left-hander at the top end of the circuit, but uh, he'd worked it a couple times before. Well, I'm quite amazed by this out, to be honest. Top five, and he's got to be happy with that today. So, uh, Philippard's bike just... Breaking. It's just a little bit loose at the back end, isn't it? You know, um, not getting the power down. And it just doesn't look comfortable. I don't know if that's just the, the way the circuit is, the, the physicality. Uh, we know he's a strong lad, but look, the Dyker up the inside. Let's him through. Almost gets his leg ripped off as well, but uh, <laughs> Philippart's then losing two positions in, what, half a lap? 
going down to seventh position now as Kenda Dyker charges through on the red LS Honda. I just wonder if he might have a little problem there, David. I mean, I've never really heard him say he likes or dislikes this track, but, I mean, his results speak for themselves. He's always gone pretty quickly here. But he's having a look around. He's kind of like, you know, he's not really on the gas, you know. It's uh, Yeah, it's sometimes wonderful. if you break your rhythm, break your concentration, sometimes it's very difficult to get that back. And then when it's as hot as this is now, you really, where you didn't feel the heat before, you then start to feel it. And, you know, and then yeah. when you back off, you're not riding at 100%. And when you're not riding like that, the suspension then not working for you properly. And, and suddenly you start getting shipped to bits, you know, as a result of that. You try everything, you try different things, and uh, it doesn't really work for you. And then you get frustrated, and then you make more mistakes mistakes because you want to catch the guy ahead of you you want to stay ahead of the guy behind you and, and I think maybe that is just in that that mode where it's just a little bit frustrating for him at the moment I don't know we'll just have a look here I mean for us I'll be looking at Cairoli's line so let's see if he can launch something against the, uh, the Sicilian in the last phase here but I mean Philippas's last lap even before he was passed was two seconds slower so it's uh, what's up there with the with the Italian well Evgeny Bobrashev so far Hardly putting a wheel wrong on that Honda World motocross machine. He lapped uh, 204.6, so two, uh, well, half a second quicker. Max Nagel, that gap now down below 12 seconds. It's 11.8. And you just wonder what's going through the mind of Evgeny Bobrashev now as this race draw, uh, draws to a concluding, uh, a conclusion, shall we say. 11 seconds has gone down a little bit, but he must surely just be into that, you know, end of the race cruise. I guess what he's got to uh, maybe not think about doing is looking across, you know, when he comes over the, the yeah. tabletop in the opposite way and looking across and then seeing a glimpse of an orange KTM from Max Nagel and then maybe a, a, a speedy closing in uh, KTM of, of Tony Cairoli. And I think as long as he just keeps his focus and keeps looking at the door signals, I think he's going to be fine. But uh, you just never know. We're going down to speak to Honda. I'm here in pit lane with Lorenzo Ressa. Lorenzo, we've got just four or five minutes left of the race. Can Bobby keep his cool? <laughs> I don't know. You know, this guy is not normal, honestly. <laughs> it's something amazing, but it's absolutely not normal. Uh, I cannot believe anymore. I cannot believe anymore. I have to wait all that seven, eight minutes, a couple of laps, and we'll see. We cross everything we have to cross. Thank you. Well, best of luck, and thank you, Lorenzo. Thank you, too. I think he'll be struggling to keep control more than his rider to. I, I think he either. will, but uh, it'll be interesting to see if, uh, of course, we've still got four minutes plus two to go. Uh, if he uh, brings it over the line, you know, what the celebration will be, whether it'll be a, a rather sedate one or it'll be... Uh... <laughs> I think might, there might be clothing shed, actually, Paul. It might be, uh, could be quite wild. Max Nagel comes over the more Miley, drops down around the back of pit lane. He's uh, got just under four minutes to go, plus two laps. He's got Tony Cairoli, who was four seconds behind him at the start of that last lap. But we can see there from the flash of orange in the background, Tony Cairoli probably just a little bit closer, although maybe not threatening at the moment. So Max Nagel might... Uh... There's three seconds on the last lap. Let's see what it is now. Well, there's uh, Nagel. There's Cairoli. And it's down to two. So Tony Cairoli, well, he won't mind. He won't get all sentimental for uh, Max Nagel's sake, will he? He's not bothered whether he... Uh whether Max finishes second, third or first in this uh, overall Grand Prix, as long as he can get a few more points, that's all Tony Cairoli is bothered about. We saw him dispose of Stephen Frossard a couple of three laps ago, who's now just dropping back there in the distance. And he's going after his teammate, Max Nagel. And, um, well, that time, last time around, Cairoli, 204.4. 205.9 for uh, Max Nagel, so uh, considerably quicker. Mm -hmm. I mean, you'll, you'll pick up uh, four oh, more. Almost off the bike there, had to stretch the leg. Now four more points over uh, Clement de Salle, who finishes if everybody stays where they are. And Frossard as well, chipping a little bit away at de Salle, just keeping in front of him. Bobrashev taking that gap back out to 12.3, so uh, in control of the situation is Bobrashev on the factory Honda at the moment. And, uh, well, this will be a great result for him. Uh, we haven't had a, an overall winner since Vladimir Kavinov in uh, 1980 on the 250 KTM. That was a Russian Grand Prix as well at Kitchenev. But uh, in terms of actual race wins by Russians, not entirely sure whether we've had any since then, actually, since 1980. No, and some uh, fresh rumours around in the paddock in the last week or so that there might be a Grand Prix in Russia in the not too distant. So, you know, well, that's... Uh... I did an interview with him a few years ago, and he said, uh, I asked him how the state of Russian motocross was and the national championship and stuff, and 
you know, he's a real character, and he just said, like, basically, some of the tracks, you know, they don't even have a road to get yeah. to the track, you know, it's kind of, we just end up in a sort so of marshy wilderness, and so suddenly it's uh, So when we talk about infrastructure then for a Grand Prix, we might have to put a road down first. <laughs> yeah, that yeah, that might be, <laughs> might be a prerequisite. Thing. But uh, no, I think uh, I think it would be good, you know, if he can have a, you know, if he starts being one of the stars of MX1, uh, you know, Grand Prix racing, then um, why not have a Russian Grand Prix? You know, if if they have the circuit to uh, to cope for it, well, of course we've seen now anyway over the past few years that you know Youthstream are more than willing to uh, to go and, and create circuits elsewhere, like in Brazil, like in Turkey, and you know, and uh, maybe they've got a, a, a plot of land earmarked already. Uh, with uh, Evgeny Bobrashev's uh, advice, yeah, he's a good he's a good ambassador for the sport and also for Honda. So it's uh, it's one of those markets, isn't it? And also with the Football World Cup there coming in in 2018, you know, there's there's going to be a view towards the infrastructure being, you know, uh, built up and oh! kind of really almost like right on the edge now. Great. Yeah, well, Bit of speed up the hill. Yeah, Nagel just uh, got the back end out going up over the step up just as we saw uh, Kenda Dyker closing in on Clement de Salle as well. So we've got a couple battles going on here. Look how deep those ruts are. Go inside, right defensive. You might just get hung up. Saw Frossard just going around the outside a moment ago. It's still the longest route to go, though. So we've got 36 seconds on the clock. There's going to be uh, two laps to go, I think, as we come around next time around. Bobrashev still has 11.8 seconds over these two. Second and third in the race. Number two, Max Nagel, 2.22. Tony Cairoli, Frossard is fourth, De Salle is fifth, but he's coming under pressure from the number nine of Kamar, uh, Kenda Dyker. Then we've got David Philippart with uh, Rui Gonçalves, Jonathan Barrigan and Steve Ramon down in tenth, ahead of Sean Simpson, David Guaneri, Xavier Borg, Mark Deruva, Tanel Leoc in fifteenth, ahead of Brad Anderson on the PAR Honda in sixteenth, then Greg Aranda, Marcus Schiffer, Schmidinger and uh, Matthias Walkner. Look at that line again from Tony Cairoli. Doesn't use it to such good effect, but you just sense that, oh, nice scrub there, Stunning. and look at that. He pulls something out of nothing there, does Tony Cairoli. He was a couple bite lengths behind Max Nagel at the end of that straight, but by the time he got to uh, the work area in that left-hander, he found a way through and easily carved his way past his teammate Max Nagel. So uh, Cairoli now up into second position, and that uh, extends his points lead over uh, Commander Sal, who's oh, just Under coming under pressure. Again. Yeah, from uh, Big Ken. That's why Cairo is a world champion, really, isn't it, There's a little bit of creati creativity, a little bit of an assessment there of the, the conditions and the way the track's changing. It's, um, it's, it's good to watch, isn't it? And we, you know, you mentioned as well that he, the, when we had, uh, I think it was Nagel, Frossard and Cairoli, and you said if they stay like this, it's not really going to be, it's going to be a static result. You know, there's nowhere, they're all within half a second of each other. As we look at the slow-mo again, watch how he scrubs his way here. Look at the difference in height, and he's just hard on the brakes. Got the commanding line down the inside. Nagel would have known he was there, and uh, in the end offered no resistance. But when they were three together, Nagel, Frossard, and Cairoli, you could just see Cairoli just hanging back. He was in no rush. He, okay, he, he, he said the lead has gone, but uh, you know, the sal has gone from that on-board camera, so he must be behind Kenda Dyke now. There he is, uh, the wide shot. And uh, he just bided his time to Tony Cairoli and eventually said, right, I've looked at some nice lines here, I've sat back, they're using those inside, that's not really working for me. So, um, OK, try and carve some new ones. And like you say, Adam, that's why he is uh, a world champion, because of the creativity uh, and the confidence just to go and look for things and not get flustered and, uh, and, and beat himself up over it. But what a great ride this guy's had. Evgeny Bobrashev, he's... Uh, before, I don't know if you heard the pre-grid interview with Georgia Lindsay, um, she was talking about the starts, and he said, yeah, you know, if I... Uh, at least if I can get to the stripe, I'll pick up you know another you know 250 big ones or whatever, and uh, <laughs> that was his focus just to get the whole shot. And then he's just gone, just left everybody else in his uh, in his wake really. And just passing MX3 world champion Carlos Campano, who had a crash yesterday, and I think he went to the to the gate last. So Campano not enjoying his time in MX1, although actually you know, not too bad really, is it 17th, but uh, certainly not enjoying Toyshintal, shall we say? A, we're looking at a bunch of sevens on a bike here, Paul. I just wonder what happened to uh, Christoph Paul Sal 377. Um, are you going to go and ask him, or shall I? I'm not asking him. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, maybe we'll leave it to Team PR. You know, um, you know, the less I say. <laughs> but anyway, Last final lap. lap. Evgeny Bobrashev, he's led Ball each and back in front of the Doika. Little battle of Belgium going on here. So Bobrashev has led each and every uh, lap of these 18 that he's done so far. Martin Barr just getting hung up there on that proper.com. KTM number 50, wildcard entry for him this weekend. Hasn't been inside the top points in this first moto. But uh, as you said, 
DeSalle found a way back past uh, Kenda Dyke. I wonder if it was a mistake, though, because he was, um, when we saw the long shot a moment ago, the previous lap, he had quite a good uh, cushion, didn't he, Kenda Dyke? Yeah, and the Dyke had done, uh, well, actually on the last lap there, a 207 for DeSalle, so it must have been a mistake because it was a slower lap from, from the Suzuki rider. But through the waves here, well, I like this part of the track now. It just opens it up, just gives it a little bit more rhythm, a bit more flow. That 90 degree right left to get back yes. onto this particular straight was just a bit notchy wasn't it and a bit dodgy on the first lap with that little step up that they had to uh, encounter but you know, it's a bit more scenic doesn't it Paul it's like you know and you get I mean that that camera angle as well is great because you can see the people on both sides of the track and we notice how busy it is here I mean just a, a point there also Philip has gone down to ninth now so he's been passed by Rui Gonsalves and also Jonathan Barragan so and how far has he got with um, Steve Ramon uh, six seconds so you'd yeah. think that he'd keep that one you know close to his chest but final lap He's going to say with this, that's for sure. The gap uh, was 10.6 seconds as he started his final lap with Genny Bobrashev on the uh, Honda World Motocross machine. He's uh, going to see pit lane ahead of him, but I don't think he'll be looking too far ahead at the moment in terms of celebrations. He's just been absolutely sublime in this first moto. We haven't seen too much of him because he's been that far ahead. But to be that far ahead... He's always had 10 seconds, isn't he? He's always had that, like, you know, that cushion. He was three seconds quicker on the first lap. That went out to five, then seven. And before you know it, yeah, within four or five laps, he was 10 seconds clear. And he's done well just to keep it there. And uh, he's not faltered. Well, he just takes a long look yeah. over his shoulder just to see exactly where everybody is. And uh, Evgeny Bobrashev, where he's going to come down through the dip for the final time. The penultimate corner awaits. He gets out of there nice and easy. And Evgeny Bobrashev can't believe it. He takes the Monster Energy finish line jump. He takes his first ever race win in MX1. He <laughs> celebrates and salutes and he winds up the crowd here. And uh, wow, a great moment for him. And for Honda, for Lorenzo Resta, for uh, Paolo Martin, his girlfriend there, giving him a nice hug. And uh, there is Lorenzo Resta, the team manager. History has been made here. The first Russian to win an MX1 uh, race in, uh, since 2004 when it was born. And, uh, yeah, Evgeny Bobrashev, a great ride what? and a great moment. And what a season. I mean, that's his first uh, main victory. And I think it's, well, he's had three podiums so far. So 2011 been the, the scene of his first podium. Kevin Welch just comes in to congratulate them as well. And uh, <laughs> well, that's the only problem that he's had. He gets it fired up eventually, and uh, he's going to go down to the podium area. And uh, we'll be interested to hear what he has to say and uh, how happy he is. But uh, with the race over, then <laughs> Lorenzo Resta, the happiest man in the paddock. Bobrashev wins it here in Toyshental, the first time a Russian has won since, well, we don't know how long. <laughs> so, what do we say to that? Genny Bobrashev, the happiest man in the paddock, Lorenzo Resta, maybe slightly more so, I don't know, but uh, Cairoli second in the end from Frossard third, Nagel fourth. It's been quite a while since the Russians made an impact in this area of the country, Paul. Frossard, the third step of the podium on the final lap. Yeah, absolutely. We can, well, we completely missed that. We are concentrating on, on Bobrashev and makes the top three. Wow, Genny Bobrashev, his season just goes from strength to strength, gets better and better, and very, very subdued look. It was just a simple celebration. Yeah, he's done it. Tony Cairoli came over the, uh, the line as well. Evgeny Bobrashev, you got the whole shot, Love My Time whole shot award, but you won your first ever GP, Evgeny. Yeah, that's great. I make whole shot until the end. So that's the last time I done this. It was in Russia a couple of months ago. So and in the at the GP, it's amazing, really good. I have no words. I just keep all my exciting inside and just go in a camper and break window maybe because I'm so exciting. <laughs> well, you got the Love My Time whole shot award there, Evgeny. Again. Evgeny Bobrashev wins the first race here at Toyshental. As we look at a slow-mo of the start, he just pulled the massive hole shot going down into that first right-hander. He pulled the 250 big euros from Love My Time. And then he went on to win the race. My thanks to Adam Wheeler from On Track Off Road, who's just left our booth to go and get some uh, feedback from what happened from the riders as we go into the second race a little later on. But uh, in a moment, we'll see the official results here from this first race of the MX1 category. And uh, I think we're bringing you that in a couple of seconds, actually.
Evgeny Bobrashev, 777 on the factory Honda. Got off to the perfect start. And he went on to win the race on that Honda for Russia. Cairoli was second in the end. Frossard third, almost caught Cairoli ahead of Nagel. And then it was De Salle, a good ride for him, hung on for fifth ahead of De Dijka, Gonsalves and Barrigan. Philippas was ninth, dropped backwards throughout the race. Ramon was tenth ahead of Sean Simpson, David Guarneri, Xavier Borg, Mark de Ruva, Tanel Leoc, Brad Anderson picking up points in his first Grand Prix of the season. Then it was uh, Gregory Aranda, Marcus Schiffer, Matthias Walkner and Gunter Schmidinger. No points for Carlo Campano, Carlos Campano. Kevin Wouts on the file of Kawasaki. And there you see the rest of the guys down there. Porcel pulled out. 